By what name are you known? There are some who call me... Tim? Welcome to another episode of Timmy Talks, the channel where we talk old school magic. And today you are going to see the first match played in the Dark Constructed Tournament. Yes, you've heard that correctly. I have organized a The Dark Constructed Tournament to thank all my patrons. So if you were a patron, you could just jump along and you could sign up for this tournament. And actually, a lot of patrons did. I believe we have 30 people that have joined us for this tournament. And in the upcoming weeks, I will be showing you uh, my matches in the group stages, but also the quarterfinals, the semifinals, and of course, at the end, the finals. So um, before we start jumping into the decks that we're going to take a look at, I just briefly would like to discuss the rules with you. They're quite simple. You need to build a 60 card deck with a 15 card sideboard and um, your deck needs to be constructed only out of cards from the dark expansion with the exception of basic lands. So of course you can use basic lands outside of the dark because they're not in the dark, right? Um, there's only one card that is restricted and that is Maze of If. No cards are banned. So all the cards in the dark are accessible for this tournament. Okay, and now let's uh, discuss this specific match. This is my first match in the Swiss round and I'm going to play against Brian who built a deck that he has called Brothers in Arms. It is a white and it is a red deck and I myself am playing with a red and a blue deck. Of course, both completely the dark brews. Now, before I go into the deck deck, and I think it's really interesting to, to watch the deck deck before going to the, to the games. Um, but what you can do if you'd like to skip the games, you can check the description below. Like always, there you will find a timestamp that reads MTG Games. Click on there and that will take you straight to the action. And here we are going to start with the deck deck. And I think I'm going to start with the player on the left. And that is Brian. Let's take a look at his deck. Brothers in Arms. And here we see the deck of my opponent, Brian Brothers in Arms. As you can see, it's got red and it's got white cards. Um, what's really interesting here is that you see the cards that make white so strong and you also see the cards that make white so weak. And what I'm referring to is the uh, four preachers and the four witch hunters. So if you get this on the board, it's a really nice combo. It's expensive though, but what you can do with witch hunter, it's two white and two to cast. And first of all, you can tap it to deal one damage to any target, right? Which is kind of weird for a blue card, or for, sorry, for a white card to have a blue ability. That's what I'm trying to say, because it's kind of like a Timmy from the dark. Now, um, important here to note is that Witch Hunter can only deal one damage to target player, so it cannot deal a damage to any target, only to target player. Then there's this other ability that's also very blue. Uh, for two white and one, you can tap it, and then it's, it reads return target creature opponent controls from play to owner's hand. Enchantments on target creature are destroyed. So it can save you from a control magic, which is actually pretty sweet, like in the most efficient way possible, right? You get your creature back and the um, control magic is destroyed. Another thing is quite nice is how it works with preacher. So there's a really nice synergy between these two. Preacher is two white and one for a one one creature from the dark and you can tap it to gain control of one of opponent's creatures, but you, but the uh, opponent gets to choose what creature you get. But with Witch Hunter, you could first bounce the creature back that you don't want, and then use Preacher to get the creature you do want, because that is the one that's left on the board. So these two cards make white very, very strong. And you would maybe expect a lot of people to choose white over any color just because of these two cards, the problem of both of these cards is are they are a bit slow. That's not even the biggest problem because it's quite a slow format as you will see, uh, but they are both 1-1. One, one. So there are a lot of cards that can kill Preacher and Witch Hunter. In green, for example, you've got Tracker, but in red, I think you've got the best weapon against these two guys, and they are Brothers of Fire. So they're also in this deck. Two red and one, it's a 2-2 two, two creature. And for two red and one, and you don't have to tap the Brothers of Fire, so you can use this immediately. You do need six mana, of course, four of those red, but believe me, that does happen. You can cast Brothers of Fire, and in the same turn, you can knock out a Preacher or a Witch Hunter. Brothers of Fire, I think, is one of the strongest creatures in the format because of this ability. It's really unique. And yes, um, it also deals one damage to you, so for every damage you deal to a creature or, or of an opponent or to, to your opponent it also deals a damage back to you. 
That's true, but it's just an immensely strong card. And I think in this tournament, we will see Brothers of Fire being very, very important. Um, let's look at the other red cards, by the way, now that we're here in this red section. Uh, Fisher, what a card in this format. Removal is really key. Fisher is great. Two red and three. Target land, land or creature is buried. Now remember, Maze of If, which is right next on the deck photo to, to Fisher, is restricted, right? So you don't need your Fishers necessarily to all the time take care of the Mazes of If. But of course, when a Maze of If is there, you can use it to take care of that Maze of If. Also, there are some special lands in um, in this game that might see some some play. City of Shadows, Safe Haven. So you can use your Fisher to get rid of those. But of course, you will mainly use it to bury the creature of your opponent. Bury again is important because it means that your opponent cannot regenerate the creature. You may think, is that relevant? Yes, a card like Ghost Ship has regeneration. Also, there are cards in green that can have regeneration in some kind of weird way. So it is actually relevant that the creature gets buried. Um, overall, my my look on this deck, I think it, it it looks pretty strong because he's got he's got creatures early game. You know, although he doesn't have a one drop, but he's got creatures early game with uh, with Pikeman. Uh, with Goblin Rock Sled, he's playing against me, I'm playing with Red, so the Rock Sled can actually attack. If he can get them together in a band, that could be just really annoying for me. And he also has Knight of Thorn that has, has protection from Red, so I cannot play a Fisher on it. It also has Banding, so there are a lot of things happening here. And I think what Brian basically wants to do is, uh, in the early game, he just wants to put creatures out, put pressure on me with attacks, preferably attacks with banding. And then later in the game, when he gets his Witch Hunter Preacher machine going, he will just take over control. So um, I like the fact that he's building two aspects. You know, there are two strategies. There's this early game that will slowly go into mid game, late game, and then mid game, late game, he will probably win the game on Preacher and Witch Hunter. So it seems to be a pretty solid strategy. This is the deck of Brian. Now let's take a look at my deck. And here we see the deck that I am playing this tournament with. I have called this deck the Ghost Family, named after the four ghost ships and also the Brothers of Fire and the Sisters of the Flame that are uh, in this deck. So I thought, hey, they're kind of like a little family. Let's go with that theme. Now, as you can see, um, there are a lot of flyers in this deck. The Dark doesn't have a lot of flying creatures. Actually, there are only three. There's Bog Imp, there's Fire Drake, and there's Ghost Ship. Now, as you can see, I'm playing with two out of the three of those. So that is one of my strategies, right? Just win purely by, I have a flyer with evasion. You don't, I'm gonna deal damage. You cannot block it, I'm gonna win the game. Sometimes strategies can be as simple as that. But there are also other like little tricks in this deck. So one of the other themes is really tapping creatures down. So as you can see, I've added Barrel's Cage and Tangle Kelp. So Tangle Kelp is an enchant creature from the dark that does something that is really interesting. So um, when you play it, target creature becomes tapped. And then there's this second part of the card that reads, if the creature attacked last turn, um, it doesn't untap during the next untap step which is interesting, right? So you can have a situation where my opponent attacks, let's say with the Goblin Rock Sled, I take three damage. Then it's my turn. I cast a Tangle Kelp on the Goblin Rock Sled and the Goblin Rock Sled actually doesn't untap anymore because it attacked the next turn. So he will have to wait an extra turn before it untaps. Now on this picture here, you see another card that's Barrel's Cage. So I've boarded Barrel's Cage in, it's four to cast. It's an artifact, and for three, it reads, target creature does not untap as normal during its controller's next untap phase. So in other words, if I've got a barrel's cage on the board, I can play my Tangle Kelp, the creature of my opponent becomes tapped, and then I can play pay an additional three and to make sure that the creature doesn't untap in the next untap step. So I can kind of keep it tapped, you know, stay down. Um, this is, you need a lot of mana to make this happen. And you'll see with these strategies in the dark, with the, these synergies, you just need tons and tons of mana to do what you want to do. And that's why a lot of players, wisely so, have decided to play with at least 24 lands and power stones. Some people even with more mana sources than that, of course, depending on your strategy and how mana hungry you are. But in general, I have to say, the dark is very mana hungry. Another thing that I noticed and you can see that as well, looking at the, the deck picture, well, you got to zoom in, I guess, is a lot of these cards require 
double color cost. So double blue, double red, but that's also in white. We saw that with the witch hunter. We saw that with the preacher, but also in green, every color has a lot of dedication. So it's really difficult in this format to play with more than two colors. It's really hard to splash anything. I think a mono color or two colors is probably the best way to go. And I think most people decided to go for two colors because the dark is a small set. And when you play with two colors, you have some more choices. Now, there are also some similarities here between my deck and Brian's deck. Obviously, we're both playing with four Fisher because it's just such a good card. Uh, my opponent is playing with, I believe, uh, four Brothers of Fire. I'm only playing with two Brothers of Fire. Maybe that's a mistake. We'll just have to find out. I'm also playing main Sisters of the Flame. The reason for that is that Sisters of the Flame can give me that third mountain that I need uh, to cast my Ball Lightning. Now, Ball Lightning, in a way, it's one of the stronger creatures in the dark, right? It's three uh, red to cast for a 6-1 Trampler. And I actually have a picture here where you see the Ball Lightning in the back behind the Dance of Many. And it's a 6-1 Trample. It can attack a turn, the turn it comes into play, but it also uh, destroys itself. So it removes it. It doesn't remove, it goes to the graver, by the way, but it destroys itself at the end uh, of the turn. So um, the situation that you can have here, and that's actually what I'm going for, is I want to play my Bow Lightning, and then for two blue, I want to cast Dance of Many. So I want to make a clone of the Bow Lightning, being able to attack for 12 in one turn. You're probably already thinking, um, Timmy, this is again, you need three red, you need two blue. Is this really going to happen? I think it is. I'm actually not worried about that. What I'm worried about is the fact that bull lightning is very fragile. If my opponent has a mace, it doesn't work anymore. If my opponent has, in this case, a pikeman, it doesn't work anymore. Remember, pikeman is a first striker that takes out my bull lightning. It doesn't even get a chance to deal any damage. If my opponent has... Brothers of Fire, it can simply deal a damage before the Bull Lightning gets a chance to attack. So there are a lot of cards that can actually, I haven't even talked about the Fisher. you know, there are a lot of cards that can kill my Bull Lightning. So it is, it is a very, very, very dodgy strategy, right? Um, but if it works, you can deal 12 damage. Another synergy here is um, the Save Haven with the Bull Lightning. So Save Haven is a land from the dark uh, to and tap. You can put target creature in the Save Haven. During your upkeep, you can choose to sacrifice Save Haven. And all the creatures that are in the Save Haven then come back into play. So what you can do is you can play your Bull Lightning. After combat, you can put it in the Save Haven. And then next turn, you can sacrifice your Save Haven. And you can attack once again with the Bull Lightning. So... That is kind of a dream scenario. Again, you know, Safe Haven is two and tap, so you need two mana. You just need tons and tons of mana. So now, hopefully, you understand why I'm playing with Sisters of the Flame. Another really cool card in this deck is Amnesia. Uh, three blue and three to cast, and then uh, look at target player's hand, and target player discards all non-land cards from his or her hand. Now, usually, you would think, okay, you need six mana to cast this, right? By the time you're casting this, your opponent will probably have a pretty empty hand. So you're actually not discarding that much. In the dark, it's really um, a slower format. Um, and I think that Amnesia can be good maybe to discard three cards, maybe to discard two cards, if you're lucky more than that. Uh, but there's something else you have to realize. It's really difficult in this format to actually draw cards. The only way to draw cards is via Book of Rass. And yeah, not a lot of people play Book of Rass because it's six mana to cast, it's two to activate, it, it takes life from you, it's it's a difficult card to play. I'm expecting to see it at this tournament, but I also understand that Brian is not playing it. As you can see, I'm not playing it as well. Maybe I should, time will tell. So um, this is kind of my deck. Is there Are there any other synergies I'd like to discuss? Well, what you can see in my main board uh, or my sideboard is a little neat trick that I'd like to share with you. I'm not going to do it in this matchup because my opponent doesn't play with blue, but I'm playing with Giant Shark, which is a 4-4 for 6. I know it doesn't sound it doesn't sound that impressive. Um, and it can only attack if the opponent has islands. So if my opponent has islands, I can board this in. The cool thing about Giant Shark is that if it gets blocked by a creature that has already taken damage, it gets plus 2, plus 0, oh, and trample. So it becomes a 6-4 with trample. If I can combine it with Brothers of Fire, I can attack with my Giant Shark. I can wait and see 
um, with what my opponent wants to block the giant shark and then I can deal a damage to that blocker with my brothers of fire enabling that plus two plus oh trample bonus of the giant shark uh you know is this a winning combination no is it a fun cool kick-ass combination yes with a capital y you know i mean it would be so cool to pull this off for the same reason i've had goblin digging team in my sideboard just to get rid of a uh, carnivorous plant you know that would be fantastic as well but that is not going to be relevant for this match okay <laughs> i'll stop rambling on because there's so much more i'd like to tell you about this deck but we'll we'll be here t until tomorrow night so this is my deck uh, pause it if you like to have a closer look. Uh, let's now go to the game's game one here and uh, let's see how this uh, match turns out. Let's go, game number one. Game number one, let's go. Island for me and a Fountain of Youth, the artifact for zero and two and tap, gain one life. There's a basic mountain from my opponent, Brian. Second blue here, not making any life, playing a Felwer Stone instead. I think we're gonna see a lot of Felwer Stones as two drops. There are the pikemen from Brian, 1-1, one, one, first strike and banding. And I think the banding could be quite annoying later in the game. Another island, not finding any mountains it seems. Of course, I can make it with my Felwer Stone. At this point, remember, we haven't seen each other's decks, so my opponent doesn't know that I'm actually playing with red as well. There's another white mana, but no more pressure for Brian. So that's good news. Hopefully it gives me some time haven't found a land here. Remember, I'm playing with 22 lands, no, sorry, 24 lands and two Felwer Stones, and still I'm kind of stuck here. Finding another Felwer Stone at least, double red. There is a Fire Drake, so a 1-2 Flyer, and I can pump it for one red, making it a 2-2 two -two when I attack. And he's actually not, oh, of course he's not attacking me because it's got a 1-2 Flyer, that makes sense, sorry. So um, I'm kind of getting back into this, or actually I'm taking over. There's a Fisher on his single red. And remember in this format, you need double red for most of the creatures and most of the spells like Fisher double red, Brothers Fire double red. So by taking care of that red mana, I'm really slowing Brian down here. Attacking for one, gonna put me onto 19. And another plane, so he's really stuck, cannot find a second red source. Remember um, the consequence of me using, oh, what are we seeing here, Amnesia? Amnesia, oh, this is such a killer for my opponent. There goes the entire hand of Brian. And this must be game. I'm gonna attack, of course we're gonna, he's still on 18, I only have a Fire Drake, but still, this is gonna be really difficult for Brian to get back from. Finding another Pikeman, attacking me, gonna drop to 18 here. Playing another mountain. I have enough mana at this point in the game. Playing Dance of Many over my Fire Drake, attacking him here for two, so he's gonna drop to 17. And next turn I can start attacking him for four at a time. He's found his mountain. Gonna attack me for two, I'm gonna drop to 16. Of course I can use Fountain of Youth as well. So I'm gonna drop to 16, end of turn, gonna make the live, gonna go back up. Remember, I gotta pay two blue exactly for my Dance of Many. That is now a Fire Drake as well, so I can draw. Playing another mountain, attacking. Yes, yeah, so I'm dealing four damage here and passing turn. There is another plane jet. This is a little bit frustrating for, uh, for Brian here. Couldn't find that double red and I had that amnesia to just steal his entire hand. That was pretty uh, deadly, pretty brutal. I guess that's the word I'm looking for. Attacking here. For some reason, I'm not pumping up the fire drake. That is a surprise. I think that's actually a mistake. There is a barrel's cage and he can play it and he can keep one of my dragons tapped, one of my drakes, I should say. So you can see the button there that's indicating that it remains tapped. And there, oh, of course, I wanted to use the Brothers of Fire to get rid of a pikeman. Now I understand why he didn't pay that uh, single red earlier. Anyway, untapping now. And what am I going to do? Killing the pikeman as well. I'm going to attack here with both. Remember, I can still use the ability of the Brothers of Fire, even if it is still tapped. I think that Brian is now just going to use this Barrel's Cage to keep both of uh, two creatures tapped. Probably Brothers of Fire and my Fire Drake. And you're probably hearing some construction. My uh, my neighbors are doing some construction, so I'm sorry if that's a little bit annoying. 
There is another Felberstone. Yeah, and, and Brian can't do much. I mean, he can kind of stay alive here. And what I'm doing here, I'm also using my Brothers of Fire now to deal extra damage. And I'm going to attack. Probably should use my Mace to untap my attacker here. Not doing it. Okay, that is not a smart move. Oh, look at that. Brian's actually picking it up. He's already at two. That went really faster than I thought. I didn't really check his life total. It was already down on just two single lives. So I think that Amnesia uh, was really a killer here for, for my opponent, Brian. So this is just the first game. We're going to have a look at our sideboards. And we'll ca catch back up with you in game uh, number two. Game number two, and it is Brian on the play here. It looks like I'm taking a mulligan and redrawing my seven, I believe. We'll see. We'll see soon enough if I put a land on the bottom. I'm not okay, so I didn't take a mulligan, it seems. Uh, starting here with a Dark Sphere. That's a card coming in from the sideboard, actually, to protect me from uh, the Eternal Flame. But what I don't know at, the, at this moment is that my uh, opponent actually doesn't play with Eternal Flame. So I assumed he did because he was playing with red. And there is a Fountain of Youth as well. So again, the Fountain of Youth. There is a Felwer Stone. So things are looking... Oh, look at this. He's ramping up. Things are looking much better here for Brian. He can start swinging in and start using that Fountain of Youth again. Staying on 20. And there is a Brothers of Fire. Okay, so that can kind of help me here. Let's hope that Brian cannot get rid of it because then he can start shooting down his creatures. You can see him kind of think, asking how many cards I have in hand. Now attacking in a bands, a 4-2. Going to go to 16 here. And tapping two red. Okay, making another Felwer Stone and playing another Goblin Rock Sled. This is a lot of pressure. This is a little... Bit complicated. Maybe I should have used just my Dark Sphere to protect for that two damage. Of course, I want to keep it for that Eternal Flame, but the Eternal Flame isn't there. And look at this. No land drop for me. Just passing turn. Ooh, and this is going to be difficult. He's probably going to swing in here with everything he has. I think that... Uh, oh yeah, of course, uh, the Rock Slide doesn't untap after it attacked. It needs a whole other turn to walk up the mountain again. And now killing the Rock Slat and get, getting a damage. And look at that. Also blocking, of course, with my Brothers of Fire. And then he's using his Mace of If to take the Pikeman out of the equation. Dropping another Felwer. So that's good news for me that he's not able to put more pressure on the table. Finding a second blue source. Can I cast perhaps a Ghost Ship? Attacking him here. Dealing two damage and casting a Ghost Ship. And things are looking pretty good for me again. There is another mountain. What is Brian going to do? Is he going to attack in a band here? That's probably what I would do. I can't regenerate anyway and he can still deal 4 damage. So he can attack and after damage is dealt he can actually untap his Goblin Rock Sled if he wants to. He probably wants to keep it untapped though to prevent damage next turn with the ghost ship so i'm only attacking with the ghost ship i think that's not the right decision should have attacked with both dealing two damage remember i can still use the brothers of fire even if it's tapped so not really understanding why i've made this decision now i'm deciding to kill his goblin rock sled again doing it a little bit early a little prematurely if you ask me there is a fisher taking care of the Brothers of Fire. I still got my ship, but my opponent has a Maze of If. Showing his Brothers of Fire sticker, by the way. It's a playgroup from England. And playing a Fire Drake here. And it's also a Flyer. So this is kind of that flying strategy that I talked about earlier. In the, in the deck deck section. So he's going to take care of the ghost ship. Going to pump up the fire drake. He's going to drop to 16. Playing another fire drake. There is a plane. So again there's a lot of pressure here. On my opponent Brian. Going to take another life. Going to go up to 13. Going to untap. Attacking with everything I have. Sending back the ghost ship. Still dealing. Oh I'm only dealing one. Do I have another amnesia? Oh I've got another fire drake. 
For some reason, I want to keep three blue open. Not really sure why. This really puzzles me. I should have just pumped the fire drake, yeah, right? Hmm, I'm, I'm playing a little bit sloppy here. Anyway, I'm, I'm still ahead. Um, it looks like Brian is just not finding the spells he needs. Attacking him again, dealing six damage now with three flying fire drakes. Playing another ghost ship and passing turn here. Also have that maze, of course, to protect me. I'm on 14. Next turn, I think... No, I cannot kill Brian yet. Look at that, he's picking up his cards. He's saying, I'm not gonna win this one. So I've also won... Game number two. Now, the nice thing about this tournament is that we are actually playing three games because every game is one point. So when you win a game with 3-0, you get three points in the tournament. If you lose a game with 1-2, you still earn a point. Okay, we're going to let these players shuffle up and we'll catch back up with them in game number three. Game number three, and uh, let's see if I can win all these three games. That means three points in the tournament, so that would be a really good start for me. This is the first game or first match in the Swiss round, so I won the previous two games. And it looks like I am taking a mulligan now. So in game three, taking a mulligan, starting with one card less, a mountain by Brian. Again, that fountain of youth. I, this is every game, right, so far? Okay. Fine. Fountain of Youth, actually pretty handy, you know, it kind of gives you a place to put your mana, mana sink, I guess that's how they call it. And it gives you some life, so I'm basically just preventing the damage again from the pikemen. Ooh, yeah, this is a good card. What is it called again? Cave People, that's the name. It actually has Mountain Walk and you can also pump it. So this could be a problem for me. And it looks like a pretty good start for Brian, by the way. He has a 2-drop and a 3-drop. Again, there's my Dark Sphere but nothing else. So he's gonna attack here. So I'm gonna take some damage. I'm gonna go to 17. And oh, this is Knights of Thorn. And interesting here, we're seeing completely different cards. Cards I haven't seen in game one and two. So I guess Brian is finally kind of picking up his curve, you know, turn two Pikeman, turn three Caveman, turn four. Um, Knights of Thorn, and look at me, I'm stuck on three land, I'm taking tens of damage, dropping to 13, there is a maze of if, and again, more creatures from my opponent, and I think this is what Brian wants to do, he just wants to play out a tons of creatures, put a lot of damage on, and use his Preacher and Witch Hunter for late game, and now what can I play, Ghost Ship? Okay, I've got one Ghost Ship, but remember, my opponent has that maze of if, so he can attack, and whatever creature I block, with the ghost ship, he can simply use his mace to save it. Oh, of course, he's going to band. Really sweet. Well done here, Brian. Banding. Even double banding there. Look how big these bands are. Remember, I can't regenerate. I don't have two blue open. And the problem is I want to use my Dark Sphere on a band, but it doesn't work that way. Dark Sphere only works for a single target, so I can only cut the damage in half for one target. So that can save me, what, one life? That's like nothing. I kind of feel like I have to block. I think this is a mistake, though. I should have taken the damage. At least I can kill one of the two creatures. And he's going to put all the damage on his pikemen. It's kind of a, a difficult situation here. I guess what I could have done, or I think Dark Sphere is only damage to me, not to my creature. So I couldn't have used my Dark Sphere to save my ghost ship. Wow, this game number three is completely different than what we've seen. I'm stuck on mana and Brian is just hitting all his creatures. Well, not even all his creatures, but enough to put a lot of pressure on. This is what he wants to do, finding a Felber Stone and then casting a Fire Drake, which is nothing more than a blocker at this point. It's just going to be a chump blocker. And I don't think the Goblin Rock Slat untaps, by the way. So I think there was a little mistake there. Well... It's not going to matter that much. Attacking again. I feel like I have to block. The only upside for me with these banners is that I can just block two creatures with one blocker. I guess that's the way to look at it. And um, blocking one of them. <laughs> also using my Dark Sphere to cut some damage in half. So that means I'm only taking two damage. I guess that's kind of positive. Using his uh, mace on the rock side. That's probably what he did previous turn, by the way, Brian. I probably missed that, so sorry for that. Um, and passing turn on here. I'm only finding a mountain, it seems. I need to, what can save me here? Not much, I can, I can try to 
I've got an Inferno in my deck, but that also deals 6 damage to me and is 6 to cast. Finding a Brothers of Fire way too late in the game. This would be an absolute all-star earlier in the game like we saw in, uh, in game number 1 and 2. A Fissure to make it even worse. And that's it. I'm gaining a life, going to 8. And how much damage am I taking? Yeah, this is it. I didn't even have such a bad hand. Still with a the Fissure there. Just didn't have the time to play it out and to kind of save myself. It's really nice when you, you know, look at the first two games, you think, oh, um, you know, my deck is really trampling over Brian. Uh, but then in game three, you finally see game, uh, Brian's creature strategy work. And his deck is actually pretty solid from that moment. Um, so that's quite nice. Showing his living armor and his idea to place a living armor on, the, um, on his creature to protect it. That's quite nice. Uh, is it actually called a living armor? I think so. Maybe I made, maybe not, but I, I, I think so. Anyway, if I made a mistake with that, let me know in the comments below. Um, and I would like to thank you, Brian, um, for this game. It was really nice to see your deck working in full glory, glory in that game number two. So that means two points for me, one point for Brian. If you enjoy this tournament, then um, visit Timmy Talks again next week where I will be posting another match of the Dark Tournament. So from now on, every Tuesday, all the way up until the finals, I will be posting the dark matches. So if you enjoyed that, let me know in the comments below and I'll see you back next week, Tuesday. In between, by the way, I'm posting videos as well on the Friday and every Sunday, a mail day, and sometimes in between a few things. So it's probably best to just uh, click on that notification bell so you get notified for every video update. Talking about all that, also please subscribe if you're not a sub yet. I have still have 40% of all the visitors that is not a sub of the channel. You probably have your reasons. Maybe you don't even have a YouTube account, but if you have an account and if you haven't subscribed yet and you would like to, but simply forgot, I would really appreciate it if you would subscribe right now. It really helps the channel out. Talking about helping the channel, you can also become a Patreon on Timmy Talks Patreon page. And um, then you can join tournaments like this. You can also join our desk Discord. You can talk with all the other sailors on the boat we have more than um than 70 patrons at the moment so i feel really blessed with that talking about that let's go to the end scroll and let's check out all the amazing fantastic patrons and channel members of timmy talks what shall we do with the drunken sailor what shall we do with the drunken sailor what shall we do with the drunken sailor, what shall we do with the drunken sailor? Ik het dus, ik het dus, zomba kazink!